I'm Michelle Poirot. I'm a transit planner, and I'm the project manager on this project. And I, I manage redesigns just like this one all over the country. I worked very recently in Richmond, Virginia, and also in Memphis, Tennessee, and in Anchorage, Alaska, and Sacramento, California. And these are very different communities, although some of the same issues come up in each community. I'm really excited that you all came to this meeting because while the work that we're going to do is about you know, you can relate it to the work that just a couple of your colleagues do on designing transit routes, designing the network, scheduling the network. You know, it's, it really has to work with what everybody does here, from finance to maintenance to call center and paratransit and driving the buses and supervising. Um, in the end, the network only works if what everyone is doing is excellent and harmonized. Um, and so I'm very excited that you're all interested in this network plan, even though it's not the thing you work on every day. Um, so let me give you my presentation. And um, I think I would like to take questions as I go, rather than at the end, because maybe it's about something that's on one of these slides, and then we can just pause and look at that slide, and, and I can answer your question. So please raise your hand if you have a question as I go. OK. So. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about who's on our team. I introduced myself. I introduced Gavin. Um, our firm is called Jarrett Walker & Associates. We are a transit planning firm. We specialize in transit network plans, so plans just like this one. We don't do building light rail stations or stuff like that. We really focus on network planning, which is just that tricky question of how do you cover an area with bus lines? And it's a lot of fun, uh, but it's also pretty um, complicated and difficult. And so we try to make it clear to people. We, we try to take away the complicated parts and help people understand it. Um, we are the head of a small team that's doing this project. Another firm that's working with us is called Symbiosity. They are a local public outreach firm, and they will help us with public meetings, communication, surveys, and things like that. And then another firm that's going to help us is called Kinetics. And they are a transit scheduling firm. So they'll come in at the very end, and they will work on schedules for the routes in the new network plan. That'll be almost a year and a half from now. So uh, some of you who work in scheduling or operations, you might meet them much later on. And I should also mention Jared Walker and Associates, we're pretty small. We have 11 employees. And uh, so we, you know, we all know each other. And we're mostly on the West Coast. We have one person in the DC area. Um, but we're not. You know, we work in a lot of different cities, but we just do a couple projects on, at a time so that we can really focus. So what are we doing as part of this project? Here's our work plan. These are just the big steps. The first thing we're doing is a kickoff meeting, and that is happening right now. We'll be here tomorrow also, um, getting a little more information. We're asking for lots of data, and we're going to take that data home with us. And then we're going to start working on an existing conditions analysis and a choices report, where we look at how is the CAT system operating today? Where are the people? Where are the jobs? Where is the service? Where are the riders getting on and off? Um, all the different ways that you could measure how a transit system is performing. And we'll also look at other cities that are like Savannah in some way. And how's transit doing in those cities? How does Savannah compare in those ways? So we'll do an existing conditions analysis. We'll publish it in what we call a choices report. And I am very eager for all of you to read the choices report, or at least read the introduction and tell us what you think. Um, because it's, you know, we want to make sure that we get the facts right, right from the very beginning. And so we're trying to figure out all the facts. Some of the facts aren't easy to find from data. Some of them live in your, your heads. You know how things operate. You know some of the history. And it would be helpful to be corrected if we've misinterpreted the data or, or misunderstood the history. So uh, please keep an eye out for a draft choices report at some point um, that we'll be interested in your review of. It's called a choices report because we write it for the public and for the board. We, write it, we try to write it like a magazine article. So it's not really technical and really complicated. It's written so that a, you know, a non-transit person could read it and understand the big choices that CAT will have to make in the future. And we're going to really focus people's attention on those big choices. So once we've put out that choices report, then we'll do some community engagement. We will ask people questions about those big choices, about what's most important to them. What do they value most about transit? Then, once we've done that first round of community engagement, we will put out what I will call network concepts. We could also call these alternatives. Now, we've already asked people, hey, here are some big choices about transit. What do you think? 
cat should do. Now we're going to actually design two transit networks that illustrate the choice, that show here's what the transit network would be like if cat prioritized, say, frequency and weekend service. Here's what the transit network would actually be like. Compared to, here's another concept of what the transit network would be like if CAT prioritized having routes close to everybody, having more routes than they have today to more places. And these would be very different networks. And neither of them is technically the right network. But if we draw the two of them and show them to people, we can ask people to react to them. We can ask people which of these network concepts is more like what you want from CAT in the future. So we'll have those two network concepts. This is a really important time for us to work with staff. Uh, we'll have a core design retreat with staff to make these network concepts. And I'm going to talk a little more about that in a moment. And then um, after that, we will have more community engagement. We take these two network concepts out to the public. We ask people to respond to them, tell us you know, which one is closer to the future they want to see, and then take that input back to the board. Then, based on whatever the board tells us in response to that input, we will design a draft network plan. And this is where we'd actually design one, one map that is financially realistic that CAT could implement in the future for, for a redesigned network. And we put that out to the public. And now people will look at it very seriously because this is real, right? This could really impact their life. And we'll get community input on that draft network plan and we'll make refinements to it based on their comments, and then we'll have a final network plan. And then we'll write schedules for the routes on the final network plan. So that's the, that, those are the big steps in our workload, in our work plan. And the timeline that goes along with that is, we're going to start now with the technical work, getting the data, and doing the technical work, but then we'll start talking to the community in January of 2019, and we'll talk to them again in May and in September of 2019. It seems like the board can adopt the network plan in December of 2019. People have asked me, well, when, when will we implement? And that is not actually a question that we can answer for you. That's really a question. You know, we, we can give you the network plan and the schedules. Implementation is a lot of work. You have to move bus stops. You have to put out new public information. You have to do new you know, driver run cuts, blocks, all that stuff. There's a lot of work that isn't our specialty, but there are other. you have other other specialists who help you with that. You have people in-house who do that work. Um, and so it will be a decision for this agency to figure out, OK, if we are really feeling positive about this network plan, how quickly can we get it on the street? Um, and we'll be able to connect you with other cities that have done a complete redesign of their network recently that can give you good advice about how long it takes and, and you know how to make sure you get all the details taken care of in time. Baltimore, Richmond, Houston. All these Columbus, these are cities that have taken a completely new network and you know, either overnight or in a series of steps swapped out their old network for the new one. So not our, it's, implementation is not our area of expertise, but we know it's hard and we know how to connect you with the resources you'll need as you consider uh, what will be involved in implementation. OK. So um, the really big points of working with CAT staff, meaning you, one is the choices report. As I said, this is the existing conditions report. This is like when you go to the doctor and you have a bunch of things that you want to talk to the doctor about, but before you get to ask the doctor your question, the doctor wants your blood pressure and your height and your weight and your pulse, and, and they want to look at your chart, right? So this is the chart for your agency. We're going to do a bunch of technical work, and before we ask the public anything and before we make any recommendation, we're going to make sure we really understand how is the system doing today. So the purpose of this slide is to show you how many pictures are going to be in the Choices Report, um, because it's so much easier to read things that have interesting pictures in them. And so we're really eager for you to look through it. Even if you only look at the pictures and read the captions, that is OK. Um, but it's a good chance for us to all get on the same page about how the system is doing today. So again, keep an eye out for the draft Choices Report. We'll want your feedback on it. The next time that we'll be eager for um, a lot of participation from staff is in the core design retreat. Core design retreat is when we, this is me in a different red dress, um, when we get together with you and probably with city 
city staff, like city traffic engineers and planners, um, to actually design the network. Because we don't, you know, someone was saying earlier how wonderful that we have Google Earth and can see the world from far away. So yeah, from our desks in Oregon, we can see Savannah City streets, but that doesn't mean that we really know enough to draw new routes for you. You know enough. You plus us make a really great team. Because we, we know best practices, but you know the city and you know the people. So we will do a core design retreat, and it'll be a couple of days long. Um, and it might even be in this very room, um, where we get around a big table and we work on drawing those networks for the future. And it's a big time commitment for the people who are there all day. But every time we do this, the people who committed multiple days to be there, they come out of it saying, that was so satisfying, that was so fun. You know, I feel like I finally got to have, like, express all the ideas I've had all these years and argue about them and figure out what we can do differently. Um, so it's been gratifying for all the staff who've done it with us. So it's a big time commitment. That means it's not just hard for you to spend the time not doing your day job, um, but also for the people you report to, to allow you the time to not do your day job and to be in this retreat. Um, now, not everyone has to come all day. In fact, we don't have room for everyone to come all day. So what we normally do is we have um, uh, planning staff and key operations and supervisory staff in the room all day. But then we have a check-in or a briefing at 4 p.m. And we encourage people from all over the agency to come at 4 p.m. and see what we've been working on and ask questions and make suggestions. Um, rather, that way they, you, know, you get to see exactly what's happening as we work rather than finding out about it many weeks later. So if you hear about an invitation you know, many months from now uh, to come to the core design retreat, I'd really love to see you there, whether you come once or you come every day at that evening briefing. Um, it's great fun for us. It's a lot of work, uh, but it, it's, um, it, it, all of our clients have expressed that it's the best thing about the work we do for them is the opportunity to do this together. All right. So those are the two really big moments where we collaborate with you. And then we're going to do a lot of collaboration with the public, a lot of consultation of the public. The ways we're going to get public input are we're going to form a stakeholder committee. And we want this to be a diverse group of people representing existing riders, people who might be riders in the future, but they don't know it yet, um, employers, workers, business people, healthcare, social services, housing, advocates. Uh, we want to make get all those people in the room together, including people who might be not enthusiastic about transit right now, or maybe they feel like they're a little bit opposed or they're difficult. We want them in the room too. And we're going to take them through three meetings over the course of the year. And we're going to actually train them in the first meeting so that they are more understanding of how CAT works and the limitations on what CAT can do, but also so that they are more effective themselves at advocating for whatever it is they care about. That's our stakeholder committee. So we'll do three big meetings with them throughout the year. And then we're also going to do bus rider surveys to make sure we capture input from people who ride the buses today. We're going to do public web surveys uh, to capture input from people who ride the buses and people who don't ride the buses who are just you know, stakeholders in the city. And finally, we're going to do some pop-up open houses. So each time we're out consulting the public, we're going to have some information events wherever they are, you know, at festivals or at housing, housing uh, buildings or at whatever, whatever there's a group of people gathered, we'll go there so that we can get input from people um, in the places they already are. That's how we plan to consult the public. And it's really important to us that when we ask the public questions, we are asking them questions that for which, in response to which CAT can take some action. We don't want to ask people, what do you want? Because they will give us a huge long list. And if we hand that list to you, what are you going to do with it? You, you know, you, you can't, money's not growing on trees. So if we give you a big list of what everybody wants, you still have to do the hard work of figuring out which thing you do first and what you don't do. Or what you, what you cut to make other things possible. So the questions we're going to focus on are actionable questions that have to do with trade-offs. So here's an example of a question we can ask people where they can draw on their own personal experience, their own situation, and tell us how they want CAT to make a trade-off. 
imagine that we have, uh, here's a neighborhood with a grid of streets. This is pretty recognizable to you, I think, in Savannah. And say we've got two bus routes heading between outer areas and downtown. Two parallel bus routes. Each bus route comes every 30 minutes. Pretty good frequency, actually. And Mrs. Smith is a two-minute walk from the bus route that's closest to her. She's pretty happy with that. So she walks for two minutes, and she catches this bus to downtown. Now, because this bus comes every 30 minutes, that means if she's really unlucky, she might have to wait 29 minutes for that bus. If she's lucky, she'll wait one minute. On average, she's going to wait 15 minutes. That's the average of, of all the possible outcomes for a 30-minute bus. On average, people will wait half of the frequencies, 15 minutes. And she's going to wait. She'll either wait at the bus stop, or she'll wait at her destination. Because if she's going to a medical appointment that starts at 10 AM, well, the bus doesn't necessarily get her there right at 10 AM, right? So if it doesn't come very frequently, she actually waits at the medical appointment, because she got there earlier than she wanted to be. I'm sure you're, those of you who work on the front line are familiar with this. You have customers who need to catch a bus that gets them to work 55 minutes early, because it's either that or they get there five minutes late. So this is Mrs. Smith's experience. She walks for two minutes. She waits, on average, 15 minutes for her 30-minute bus line into town. There is another way that the transit agency could provide service to her, and that is that the agency could put those two bus routes essentially on top of each other, kind of like you already have on a couple of your north-south streets. And now, those two 30-minute routes, because they're on top of each other, there's actually a bus coming every 15 minutes. But Mrs. Smith has a longer walk. She has a six-minute walk. But she has a much shorter wait, and she can travel whenever she wants. And she's not going to be too early to things, and she's not going to be late for things. So which does she prefer? We can ask her this question. We can say, what do you prefer, Mrs. Smith? Do you prefer a shorter walk, but a longer wait? Or do you prefer a longer walk, but a shorter wait? And in fact, the wait is so much shorter that your trip is faster. You actually get there sooner. You spend less time waiting every day if you're willing to walk a little further. And this is just the math. There's no opinions here. It's just the math of how transit works. But her opinion does matter. It matters what Mrs. Smith thinks. And it matters especially what a 1,000 Mrs. Smiths think. And it matters how your board makes this judgment as well. So we're going to ask this type of question of the community. The math says that CAT can provide you with shorter walks, but longer waits, or longer walks, but shorter waits. Which do you think CAT should do? Which is more important to you as a community? Of course, individuals are going to have a different response to this depending on their situation. But we're going to want to know what the community overall thinks. So this is actionable input. that You can make this kind of trade-off within your existing budget. You don't need new money. But you do need to know if the community supports one way of doing it or the other. Another thing that we will do with the public is we'll do our best to do hands-on learning to really help people use their imagination uh, to understand these choices. So in the stakeholder workshops, we're going to play games with people that teach them how, uh, how transit works. I think that many of you are probably going to end up at the stakeholder workshop. And something that we have done in the past is we've had a couple staff tables in the back. So if you're interested in coming and playing this game, you are definitely welcome to. It's really fun. Uh, and if you don't get to do transit planning and network design in your normal job for CAT, you might get enjoy doing that for two hours um, at this workshop. So we'll do hands-on learning, and we'll also use pictures and maybe even some video to help people understand these choices. I want to give you another example. You know, I described the walking versus waiting. That's a choice that has so much to do with someone's individual situation, what, what, is, what is workable for them. But there's another way to think about that choice, which is there's, there are these choices of values, which are things about which reasonable people can disagree. Right? There are things about which you and I could sit down, and we could talk, and we would find things that we disagree about, not because either of us is wrong, but because it's actually reasonable to disagree. We value different things. And so this comes up in transit all the time. And we'll, this is also where we're going to focus the public. So here is an example of a, a question of values that comes up in transit planning. 
Imagine we are a transit agency in a, another town, and we have 18 buses. We need to serve our little urban area. This is a quadrant of the town, and these little dots are residents and jobs. And you can see there most of the residents and jobs are concentrated on these two main roads. And then there are smaller numbers of residents and jobs on smaller streets off to the side. So how should we allocate our resources? We have 18 buses. We have 18 buses to put out every day. Where do we put them? If we value high ridership very highly, we might put our buses on just the two main roads in pursuit of ridership. Maximizing ridership means that we choose which markets we enter. We don't put our service everywhere. We put it in the places where we think the market is strong. And that means on the straight lines, because the straight roads are the densest places. They have the most people and the most jobs and the most destinations. Plus, if we focus all our service there, there's a bus coming every 10 minutes. People find it really attractive. It's faster than waiting for their brother to give them a ride. It's faster than riding their bike. And so more people choose to ride it, and so we get high ridership. And the way that we would brag about this network is we'd say, this is a really productive network. Because for our 18 buses, we're getting a lot of riders. But the reason we got a lot of riders is because it's not, it's not just that we're on the main roads. It's that we're on the main roads with a lot of frequency, and late night service, and weekend service. But of course, if you look at this map, I'm sure we can all imagine people who live out here and people who work out there and how badly they need transit too. And they're not walking distance to transit. So what about them? And that speaks to another goal, which is coverage. The coverage goal means that you try to serve everyone even if they live in expensive to serve places, even if they are small in number. Even if there aren't very many people, if they have a severe need for transit, you serve them. That's, when you, that's how you meet a coverage goal. And that means that we run routes on every single street to get close to everybody. But because we've divided our buses onto so many routes, the frequencies are not good. Every route comes once an hour, maybe every 90 minutes. And the routes don't run on weekends. We can't afford to run the routes on weekends because we have so many of them. And even those two biggest, busiest streets where we have the most people and the most jobs, even on those streets, the buses only come once an hour. So where we have the most people, the service is still not that attractive. As a result, we don't get much ridership. People really respond to frequency. And they respond to span, to the bus being there all day and all week when they need it. And if the frequency is not good and the span is short, then most people will find another way. So we have lots of routes. We've covered everyone, but we don't get much ridership. The way we brag about this network is we talk about access. We say 100% of our residents have access to transit. Now, it doesn't come very often, but it's there in case they need it. If something happens in their life and they need a ride, it's there for them. And that's how you, that's how you describe the value that coverage provides. Both of these goals are really important, but they lead in opposite directions. They help us achieve totally different things. High ridership transit, in pursuit of a ridership goal, it's, it's kind of like thinking like a business. It gets us maximum job access. It gets us maximum vehicle miles traveled reduction, maximum congestion reduction. But high coverage transit, more like a public service, gets us lifeline access for everyone no matter where they live even if they live in a place that's really expensive for cat to get to because it's far away. They still are covered. It's also a way to provide equal service to every neighborhood or district, even if those aren't places where much ridership happens. So these are both valuable, but they lead us in opposite directions. Which means you do not have to pick one or the other. It's not that you have to run only frequent routes far away from each other. And, or only low frequency routes everywhere, you can actually choose how to balance these. But it's important to acknowledge that moving towards one of these goals means moving away from the other goal. The more you spread out, the less you are focusing, and vice versa. 
So this is something that we will help your board wrestle with. This is the hardest thing about transit. Because people ask for both of these things. Because we all value both of these things. People ask for routes in every neighborhood. People ask for routes, believe in routes in every neighborhood, even if, it doesn't, even if their neighborhood already has a route. They believe in it. It sounds important. But people also ask for high frequency and weekend service and late night service. And they ask CAT to get high ridership. They ask CAT to move lots of people for the, for the public money that CAT uses. So people ask for both of these things. How do you possibly reconcile it? And so that's something we'll help your board with. We'll help your board figure out how to balance these goals. What's the right balance point for CAT? This is an example of a choice of values. There are others, but I'm sure this one will come up here, so I wanted to talk about it. And then the last thing I want to say is that our firm has a mission which is to foster clear conversations about transit that lead to confident decisions. We want you, we want your riders, we want the rest of your community to have a really clear conversation about transit, about what CAT is doing, about how transit works, and about the goals that CAT should be pursuing. And then we want to set it up so that your board is able to make a confident decision so that you're able to implement a plan you feel really good about, you understand why it is what it is, and it achieves the goals that you mean for it to achieve. That's our mission here, is a confident decision. So that's everything I had to say, and I would be delighted to answer questions. If you have detailed questions about exactly how we're going to do different things or general questions, happy to take all of it. Yes? Okay, Michelle, so on the other projects that you've done, do you find that uh, transit agencies go more for the coverage or the uh, ridership or a combination of both? Or can you talk about that? Yeah, I can talk about that. So um, if you take a transit network and you run it in a city for 40 years and you don't at any point do a big difficult network plan like what we're about to do here, the natural evolution it's kind of like a coral reef. The natural evolution is that it grows more complex and it grows more coverage. Because people will call you up over the years and some influential people will call you up over the years and they'll ask you to do another loop over here and they'll ask you to stretch this route a little further over there and they'll ask you to add a stop over here. Yeah. And you do some of those things some of the time. And then they don't call you back 10 years later and say, I've moved, I don't need that stop anymore, you can take it out, right? So the network accrues pieces. And that tends to be coverage. And so there's a natural process by which coverage increases. There's not really a natural process by which uh, it decreases. And that's why there's sometimes an agency will do a reset like this. Um, that said, I have done this work in communities that said, actually, we think our balance of coverage, you know, the money we spend on providing coverage and the money we spend trying to get high ridership is about right. Um, but can, is there a better way to operate our network? Is there a better design if we keep the balance about the same? And the answer is sometimes yes. Sometimes we can make some modest changes but keep the balance about the same. Um, we've had agencies say we want vastly more ridership and we're willing to accept the loss of coverage. That's very hard politically because you really are. I mean, people. If you cut someone's service like that, and yes, you're increasing frequency and span over there, and yes, that has enormous benefits for many people who, who desperately need it. But you are leaving somebody stranded, right? And they will come and tell you you're ruining their life, and they're right. Um, so, but we have had agencies that are willing to do go that far. Um, more often, what happens is that agencies that really feel like they cannot reduce coverage, they cannot abandon anyone, even, even if they want so badly to increase their frequencies and offer longer spans and increase their ridership, sometimes what they do is they'll wait until they can raise new funding. And they'll say, we're going to keep our coverage as it is, but here's a network we can implement with higher frequencies, with weekend service, when we get new funding. So they basically will decide that they're going to spend all of their new funding on ridership generating investments. Not, so they won't increase coverage, but they'll maintain coverage. So there are many different ways for an agency to move forward. Um, but that's what I've mostly seen, is that 
coverage tends to increase over the decades. And then some agencies decide they want to keep all that coverage, and some are, are willing to sacrifice some of it to get higher ridership. It's very difficult. If there's no new money, it's a very difficult choice. Yes. I know you're just new in town, but can you um, maybe give us an estimate of how much we are now coverage versus, mm. uh, versus uh, ridership on a percentage level? I can't. Um, well, the math that we will do to do to estimate that is um, what we call it psychoanalyzing your network. Um, it's it's about eighty percent science and twenty percent art. We will look at all your routes and we will look at how many revenue hours you spend on each route. And then we will look at the ridership on all those routes relative to their cost. And we will assign each route and say this route is getting high ridership or this route really should be getting high ridership except this one little thing is not quite right and that's preventing it from getting high ridership. But it's basically a ridership route. And then we'll say, oh no, this route is really here for coverage purposes. It's not, this purpose is not to get high ridership. No one expects it to get high ridership. And we'll do that, and then we'll tally up the revenue hours, and we'll say, OK, looks like you're spending about 50% of your budget on routes that are getting high ridership or could be expected to. And you're spending about 50% of your budget on routes that aren't. So that's how we'll do the math. We haven't done the math yet. We don't have the numbers to do the math yet, but we will soon. And I don't know where you'll end up. So. But that's helpful. it's helpful to just know a starting ratio. Even though it is 20% art, even though it's not a perfect science, because it helps your board think about, OK, well, what would it look like if we just went 10% more towards ridership? You know, how much coverage would we have to give up? How much frequency would we get? It helps give the board a, a dial that they can turn, just so that they can give us instruction as to what to do. I have a follow-up question. Kind of going back to the spectrum, what would um, our ridership, or what would uh, what does our system look like if maybe we got rid of some stops? Let's say we have to stop every block. Mm -hmm. What if we maybe we had stops every two blocks or three blocks? How would that help the system? Okay. It depends on how many people are getting on at those stops. So I'm sure you have routes where you have a stop every block, but you don't have a person getting on and off at every block, right? But then you probably have bus routes where you have a stop every block, and yes, the bus is actually stopping at every stop because someone's waiting to get on or someone wants to get off. It's in the latter case that all those bus stops slow down your service. And so if you go to stop spacing, wider stop spacing, like every three blocks or every four blocks, your service might go faster, will certainly go faster. But that means people have to walk a little further. So that's, this is one of those trade-offs. Faster bus service or shorter walks. And People will have a different opinion about that depending on where they are in life and what their situation is and how sensitive they are to heat and rain. Um, the other thing is that faster bus service tends to save a little bit of money because now you, you know, a route that comes every 30 minutes that maybe you can run with, I don't know how many operators you have on your 30 minute routes, but say you can run a route with six operators that comes every 30 minutes. If it slows down, to hire another operator and add another driver to that route to keep that frequency. So the slower your service runs, the more expensive it is to provide the same value to customers. In fact, the slower your service runs, the more expensive it is to provide slower service to customers. So it's not even the same value. So that can be the advantage of taking out bus stops. When we did our work in Richmond, Virginia, um, we explained this to them. I mean, they already understood it, but we explained it to their board and their city council, and they did the math. And before we were even done with the network plan, they took out 2,000 stops. Because they realized we can't, we can't keep running service slower and slower and slower every year. And if we don't thin out our stops, that's what's going to happen. So it's, but I'll tell you, in terms of implementing changes, taking out 2,000 stops, taking out 100, 100 stops is not 100 times harder than taking out one stop. It's like three times harder, right? Because if you take out just one stop, everyone who uses that stop feels like you are picking on them and you are treating them unfairly. And why didn't you take out stops in the other neighborhood? But if you take out stops citywide, if you make changes citywide, people feel like they're treated more fairly because you're, everyone is going through the, the difficulty of the change together so that they can get the benefit of the change together. So that's why Richmond decided to go big once they did the math on how slowly their buses were running.
I outwalked a number of buses in Richmond while I was there. <laughs> Riding to and from work every day, I would just get off the bus and start walking and I would beat it. You know, so it's a very extreme case there. Yes? What is your method of experimenting? How do you keep it? Oh, thank you. Um, well, I, so Denise of Symbiosity will be directly managing the survey. She is not here right now. So I will tell you um, what I intend, but the exact, you know, how exactly we do will be influenced by her. Um, the onboard surveys, we, we will have staff people who are surveying on buses. We may, later in the project, have staff people surveying at bus stops instead of on buses because there may be materials that are a little difficult to bring on and off the buses. Um, it is our intention to survey on every route or at every bus route's bus stop at some point. And also, when we are done collecting information from bus riders, from the onboard survey, and from the web survey, we will have asked people for their zip code. And we may also ask them for an intersection close to where they live and where they work or go to school. And we'll then look to see, have we gotten input from all over the service area? So we may not get, you know, we may not have a meeting or go survey out at a certain part of the service area, but we will look to make sure that we've heard from people who live there, even if we heard from them at the transit center or if we heard from them through the web survey. So we're very concerned about geographic representation and also about hearing substantially from existing riders as well as from people who don't ride but who are eager for some change in the system. I also hope, I'm hopeful that we can advertise the web survey on the buses. So it's not just there's a rider survey for the buses and there's a web survey for everyone else, but that we're advertising the web survey on the buses so while people are on the buses they can pull it up on their phone or pull it up when they get home and do it. So um, we heard our CEO say that Um, well, so if you, if you implement a plan that's designed to increase ridership, how long would it take before you saw an increase in ridership? One thing to keep in mind is that um, the baseline is moving. So we heard him say that this is typical for other agencies. Transit ridership around the country has been going down for the past couple of years for a mix of reasons that have to do with national conditions as well as local conditions. So uh, I don't know what's going to happen nationally in the next five years. Maybe transit ridership will continue to go down everywhere. If that's the case, then I might not expect a ridership-oriented plan for Savannah to increase ridership. It might just hold ridership steady. Right? So the baseline is moving, and we'll always compare you not just to last year, but to what your peer cities are experiencing. Um, when we think about how long it takes people, how long it takes any kind of ridership gain to appear, we think about the, the levels of churn that happen in a city. So um, for example, there are people who ride transit every day and they're pretty determined to ride transit every day as long as it works for them. And if you change the system, they're going to look into it the next week, see if it still works for them. If it does, they keep riding. Uh, you know, people who are playing, paying close attention and sort of as soon as things change, they'll figure out that, oh, there's a route that's more frequent. I like that. I'm going to start riding it. Or they've added Sunday service. Now I can ride it to work. I'll start riding it. There are also people coming here constantly for school. People are constantly coming here for school or they're entering school and so they're looking to see now if they can ride transit to school. Um, people change jobs, they change houses, they change, you know, they go from middle school to high school. Every time they do that, there's an opportunity for them to wonder if CAT works for their trip and see if it does or if it doesn't. And then another form of churn is, of course, people moving here. People are constantly moving here and settling here and looking into the transit to see if it's going to work for them. So there's this, there's this churn that's happening on a weekly and monthly and annual basis of people checking out your system to see if it's going to work. Given all those types of churn, the industry standard is to, to decide whether you succeeded or not about two years after you implement. With the caveat that things can make that you know, hurricanes, 
gas price shocks, things like that can, can sort of change, change the reasonable timeline, but about two years, because you want to wait long enough for people to graduate high school, for people to change jobs, for people to move apartments uh, and discover your system when they make that change. Yeah. Michelle, on your on the surveys that you all put out, will you capture any demographic information? Definitely. Like, will people we'll yes. know if they ride the bus daily or weekly, mm -hmm. once a week, or yes. if they're busy tours? Or... Yes, we'll want to know um, how often do you ride cat? Um, you know, roughly household income, um, race or ethnicity, um, age, and something about their home location, whether it's their zip code or major intersection nearby or something like that. Yeah, because we want to make sure we get a good mix of people. And if we, we'll be tracking as we go. And if we find that we're not getting the right mix of people, we'll put some effort into going out and reaching those, those people who are harder to reach. And I'm hopeful that you all will help us with this. I mean, I know you work here, but you also, you're community members, and you have your own connections to lots of different parts of this community. And so I hope that you help us get the word out each time and get people to take the survey and come to meetings and, and pay attention to this. This is, um, you know, this is sort of once in a generation kind of effort for a transit network. Uh, most people at a transit network will only go through this type of redesign once in their time at the agency. It, it's not, it doesn't need to be done more than once every 30 years or so, and it almost never is done more than once every 30 years. So if this, if this plan is actionable, if your board decides to do it, um, this will really be a major moment, I think, in the history of CAP. And you'll need to tweak it, and you'll need to make small improvements in the future, but it'll be a fresh starting point. Yes? Mm -hmm. That's right, a year and a half. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, actually, I'm sorry, we're missing something. Implementation. So we'll have a plan for you, unless, unless the board decides they want to take more time for whatever reason, which they can do, we will have a plan for you adopted next December and we'll have schedules next January 2019. Then you need time. The agency will need time to get ready for implementation. And that might be nine months. Isn't it schedules 2020? January 2020? I'm sorry, 2020. Schedules in 2020. Thank you. <laughs> you might need, you might, you're going to need six months, nine months to implement. Uh, because, I mean, it really, how long it takes you to implement just depends on how, you know, how much staff resource you have here, how much changes. I have no idea how different this network might be. It could be fairly similar. It could be really different. We have no way of knowing that now. The more different it is, the more it means you know, drivers, helping drivers understand the new routes, if there are new operating procedures, um, if they're taking layover in a different place. I mean, you know, those things are possible. Um, moving bus stops could be a big part of it. And then certainly communicating with the public getting ready to communicate with the public so that everyone has, the drivers have the tools they need and the staff has the tools they need to answer people's questions and get people ready. Again, it could be the network plan is not that different from what you have now, in which case that's not a big effort. It could be really different. And that's, uh, that's really not up to me. That's up to your board. Um, but that's the range of possibilities. Yes? Um, you talked about getting input from the public surveys and all that. Can you talk a little bit about best practices getting input from staff internally, mm. um, especially uh, over on the operations side and the cost side as well? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Well, one thing that has been really valuable for us is getting the right people to come to the core design retreat all day and then also to come at the end of each day and check our work, essentially. So having people from the call center, having people from operations, having veteran supervisors and drivers who really know the routes, check our work as we go, um, tell us what's impossible, tell us, you know, you can't make that turn, tell us, you know, oh, that high school gets, you know, crazy jammed up, or that church, or that funeral parlor, and we're never going to get through there half the time, that kind of thing. Um, is really helpful. And also telling us, telling us how, how they think riders will react, which 
the way existing writers react isn't necessarily a reason to do something or not do something, but it's definitely something we need to know and take into consideration in making decisions. So that's getting that kind of input from staff from the whole agency is really valuable. And the core design retreat is a great place for that. So um, you know, when you see that invitation for the 4 p.m. briefing, that's a place where we would really be eager for your input on those kinds of things. And then everything we put out, every report we put out, we'll put out three major reports, we'll put out first in an internal draft. And so if, you're a, if you like to read, if you're a reader, and if you're willing to read our internal drafts and give us comments on them, we will be really excited about that. Um, so, I mean, I think it's planners, it's obligatory to read it, but you know, for everyone else, if you're willing to do it or just read the introduction and tell us if we're on the right track, um, that's a really valuable way for us to get your input on that too. So we'll put out three big reports, uh, not three important reports. Our goal is not that they be big, it's just that they be important. Any other questions or comments you want to make? I would love if you have some thoughts about how to make this a success or what's going to be challenging. I'm, I'm happy to hear that too. Uh, how long has Jared Walker been around? Like, how long has your company been around? I guess because I asked that question because I want to know like, so it, it appears that this may be like, you do this change, we go through this, and then you can't really measure probably anything in maybe five years. So, you have like, you said, we've been around 20 years, and yes, yeah, six years, Richmond called us, and they oh, this is great, or seven years, or maybe five years, somebody called us, oh, yeah. we shouldn't have did this. So uh, I, I was just curious, how you know, how long do, do you do other people, do you come back and say, in five years, if, if Richmond called you in five years ago? Didn't work. Nah, <laughs> and you know, and you said it was like a 30 year thing. Do anybody go back, they go, you know, it's going to be expensive, but we need to go back to where we were. Or, or do you say, no, we can still tweak some things we help you five years from now mm -hmm. or 10 years from now? Um, so we actually do track ridership on all the networks we've worked on. Um, and that's that's kind of fun. We There's some statistical analysis involved because, um, like I said, the baseline is always moving. We can't just take the sheer numbers. Um, but we, the firm, Jarrett Walker and Associates, is only, are we six years old, seven years old? Seven? I'm the second employee, so I've been around a lot of that. Um, Jarrett, however, my boss, and again, we're a firm of 11, so we spend a lot of time with Jarrett. He's not like a distant, faraway boss. Um, he's been doing this for 30 years, and he's done redesigns like in communities like Savannah um, for all that time. And so he has learned, he learned a lot from doing redesigns. He learned, first of all, what works and what doesn't in terms of getting ridership, but he also learned what's hard. You know, that's where our, our description of the difficulty of these trade-offs comes from, is his long experience. Um, our, our most famous redesign is the Houston Transit Network, which was done in 2015, 14? 2014. 2014. Um, big ridership gains. However, there was low-hanging fruit in Houston. The thing about Houston was the downtown, the old downtown was no longer the downtown. The downtown had actually grown a lot to the west, and they hadn't changed the transit network. They still had this radial network that went to the old downtown. All these routes on top, piled on top of each other, buses on buses on buses going to the old downtown, which was really far away from where all you know the new towers and the new downtown were. So there was some low-hanging fruit in Houston. Um, that is part of why the ridership gains were so fast and, and big. I don't know that there's quite so much low-hanging fruit in Savannah. I think that your network is not, is not that ill-fit to your region. Um, it's just like a coral reef grown some complexity uh, over the years that could be um, revised and made, it could be made simpler. Um, so we have a track record of, of network changes that have resulted in ridership gains. Um, Jarrett has a much longer track record than the firm does only because he founded the firm seven years ago. So we haven't been around long enough. I would say, you know, we're going to spend a year and a half on this planning process. You're going to need, if your board decides to implement it, you're going to need six months or nine months to get to implementation. You'll know within two years if it's working. You'll know because, and you, you'll probably know within a year. I would just say, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really, you know, 
decide for two years. Um, but you'll know because you know you'll you'll check out your peer agencies. Is their ridership going up or down or staying flat? And you'll know what your ridership is doing. And you'll start to see either there's a difference there or there's not. And if your board tells us to design a higher ridership network, and we do it and they implement it, I am very confident that you will see higher ridership than your peers, who if, your peers who do nothing. Um, so I feel confident because of the math that it will work. But that doesn't mean that it's what they're going to want to do. They may not want to do it. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Oh. Do you want to talk about that? Uh, yes, briefly. I mean, uh, high ridership, there, there's financial implications, obviously, with the high ridership system. One fair revenues, that's an obvious one. I mean, if you're going to do a low ridership system, less people are getting on the bus, and you're getting less money at the fare box. That's one area. But then also, as, as you mentioned, Patricia, uh, our federal funding from FTA is based, it's, it's this giant pot in, in Washington, D.C., and it's split up among different transit agencies based on a number of factors, including population of the community, but also ridership and revenue miles. Um, and so, in theory, if we were to grow our ridership the next year, we would get a little bit more uh, of that federal funding. Um, so there are some financial incentives towards gr growing ridership. Uh, and yet, did you have anything else? No, that's what, mainly what I wanted us to kind of touch on. Why, you know, ridership is important when we are designing our budget you know, for operating. You may also find that over a long period of time, there are some financial incentives to adding coverage. Because if you cover more municipalities, even if you're not going to get much ridership in those places, you may get funding from those municipalities. Or really, it goes the other yes. way. If you get funding from municipalities, then you may cover them. You may not get much ridership, but, but you're providing service that they value, and they compensate you for it. So coverage can also, it's less direct. It's not about a formula, but through, through the political process, coverage can support funding sources that you might not otherwise. And, and I should talk quickly about the flip side of the federal funding. So if your ridership is declining, which it is right now, and we're looking at like a four to 5% decrease in every single year, and it keeps trending that way. Because ridership is so closely connected with fair revenue, your fare revenue goes down 5% as well, right? Or something similar. Um, and then also that next year, your FTA federal funding, because you have less riders, goes down even more. So then your, your, um, your operating budget is shrinking every single year because you're getting less and less from outside. And then you have to cut service eventually. Last year we cut service in July. But then we keep losing riders. When you cut service, you lose more riders, right? So it's a never-ending spiral down, and that's and really if you why. You want to make it a steeper spiral? You raise fares, right? While exactly. You're cutting service. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that spiral, we're in the spiral right now, and that's really why we're doing this project. Is we gotta, I mean, we're trending in the wrong direction. Unless we do something now, then it's just gonna keep getting worse and worse and worse. We're gonna have to keep cutting service, and yeah. Not good. So one last question. So where do we go from here after this meeting? What's next? Ah, oh, thank you so much. What a great question. So um, I, we have a little meeting this afternoon with more planning people to talk about some data that we need. Um, we are also going to be around tomorrow. We might come find some of you with a couple questions about the work you do and, and, and some of the things you know or data that you have. Then we're going to spend the next about six weeks doing our existing conditions analysis and writing that report. And we will have a dra an internal draft choices report for people to review in, this, in the fall. Um, we're then going to kind of take a little break for the holidays. We could have public, we'd be ready to consult the public in December, but 
that's a bad time to consult the public. So we'll take a little break, and then we'll go out to the public in January. With, and that's the point where you know everyone who's coming in contact with the public and or you know working with operators who are coming in contact with the public, um, if your help you know letting riders know that this is going on, pointing them to the website, um, pointing them to the survey, uh, will be really helpful. That in January will be the first time that we ask you to help with that. So we go do our homework basically, and then we hand in our homework to you this fall, and we ask you to review it give us comments on it, and then we're ready for the, the show with the public in January for the first time. Yeah. All right, well, thank you. I really appreciate your interest in our project, and I'm, I'm, I hope that we can make it a success for you, and I look forward to talking to you about it some more in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.